friends, how are you doing? This is Jesse here with a special surprise uh, podcast only episode. This is not going to be released on video. So you guys listening on the podcast, you the real ones, you're going to get some special stuff today. Um, I am looking to try to have some more stuff on this podcast. It's not just on the uh, on the videos. And when I had this interview last week, I thought this would actually be perfect to throw onto the podcast. I was reached out uh, to by a man named Kelvin Mock. He is a uh, Asian American based in San Francisco who writes for a Asian American magazine called Joy Sauce. And uh, they reached out to me to ask uh, to talk about the tea house and the comedy and all the stuff that I've been up to. And uh, when I was doing the call, I realized like, hey, this actually kind of could be a an interesting podcast episode for everybody. So we're going to be switching up the normal way of things where I interview a friend of mine over tea. Uh, This is going to be a conversation that we had over Zoom, and I was drinking tea over here. I can't say for him, Uh, but uh, there's definitely tea involved, and we talk a little bit about my journey through China, how I stayed in China, what inspired me to get into Chinese comedy and then into Chinese tea, and then what it's like running a uh, a tea house online as a, you know, and, uh, you know, just a white guy started doing (laughs) tea on the internet. So there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. I hope you guys enjoy it. And um, uh, thank you all who have been supporting this podcast. I'm really excited to get more audio content to you, more long form stuff where I don't feel like I need to have everything edited down into 43 seconds or else it has no chance of succeeding. So um, thanks again. I'm going to air the interview right here and uh, hope you guys enjoy. Leave a comment on the podcast if you like it and enjoy. First of all, uh, it's great to speak with you, uh, Jesse. You have a pretty storied life. Uh, you were a student <laughs> at Brandeis, I think, majoring yeah. in East Asian studies and international studies. You got yep. a Fulbright scholarship to study the differences between Western and Chinese humor. And yep. you had so much fun with Xiangsheng or traditional Chinese stand-up comedy that you ended up staying for nine years. And yep. now you run this tea shop online called Jesse's Tea House. Uh, you do Gong Fu Cha, Chinese tea ceremony stuff. Um, and I think before we get into all of that, I kind of want to start from the beginning. Uh, what was the moment you realized you were going to stay in China for the long haul? And what about oh, China made you want to stay? That's a really good question. Um, so uh, thanks again for the invitation to talk. I'm, I'm excited to be able to share this stuff, especially with some of the the Asian American friends out on the channel. Um, for for my, uh, my experience and when I decided to stay, it was uh, so so when I graduated, I got that Fulbright fellowship, which was fantastic because I had basically a full year where whether I was funny or not, I was still going to get paid and I could pay rent. And like, you know, it, it was uh, it was a great chance to be able to learn and to apprentice to my my comedy master and improve my skill. And then as the uh, fellowship was ending. Uh, a lot of the other Fulbright fellows, I felt like it was a little bit of a shame because some of them had just spent a year doing all this amazing research. And I asked, like, what are you going to do when you go back? And they were either going back into academia, which essentially would mean like, you know, cloistering up with books, or some of them were going to go into like consulting. And I'm like, do you want to do consulting? And they're like, not really, but, you know, and and so I, I thought it was a little bit of a shame that we had just gotten all this knowledge and then it wasn't going to be continued in that way and i was having so much fun that i was trying to figure out if it could be continued and the logic of the time was that i was having a great time it was something i had never anticipated that i would have the sort of job where i would be able to control my own time and the moment i started planning my own time i realized that i did not want to work in an office and i did not want to have a boss if i could at all avoid it um, and basically the, the, the decision of how can I avoid having a boss and having a nine to five, uh, was the decision-making like the key point in decision-making. Cause I looked around in China and I said, you know, I could go back to the States and get a job, but I probably would have to work in marketing or something like that. I'm not going to be able to have a full-time job as a comedian in China, in America. And if I'm in China, you know, I looked at the most pro- like basically the job I you can get as a 21 year old American in China as an English teacher. So I was like, would I enjoy doing the comedy more or doing the English teaching more? I definitely enjoy the comedy more. And if I could try to make close to the same amount of money an English teacher makes, 
then I would be fine. And so that was my first goal was just like, can I kind of continue this lifestyle of running my own life, doing what I believe to be fun and interesting with the comedy? And if I could just make enough that I would be able to have a decent life in China, that was all that I uh, that I was planning Got it. Uh, so it was like so, the freedom of like the job and freedom of yeah, the scheduling. I, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm so glad that I had that chance after college to do the Fulbright because I don't know whether I would have had the courage to like go out on my own and like not have a job, so to speak. <laughs> um, you know, I, I tend to be a little bit anxious. And if I, if I, if I hadn't had a year's experience of seeing that it could work out, I don't know if I would have jumped right into it. And so I'm very glad that I had that chance because like the the kind of the core, the core principle I built my whole life around is like trying to be able to chase what I what I enjoy. And I find that if you have the time and freedom to do that, and it was it was beneficial that in China, the cost of living was lower and the risk of failing was lower. And um, uh, if you have the chance to try to pull it off, I've just found that it's I, I enjoy it a lot. So it was in many ways kind of like trying to continue the lifestyle of being a comedian was the main pull at the beginning. Um, and then, you know, uh, that left me time in the daytime to do what I wanted at night. I got to perform. It was it was a it was a great time. Yeah. And I feel like in some ways, too, it's I guess like during that time in China, like the early 2000s, uh, yeah. it was a lot easier to like be entrepreneurial than it is yeah. in america where there's so many oh, yeah. other like uh factors like health insurance or like yeah. car insurance no public transit yeah, yeah it's it's pretty crazy i mean like you know there's it's funny because like a, a sort of a propaganda phrase that went around china was called the chinese dream and it was never really that defined it was really used mostly for internal propaganda purposes but it makes you think about what is the difference between the american dream and the chinese dream and it's like, you know, co- taking politics completely aside, the place where you can pay cheaper rent but still live in a ma- in a major city, that's good for your dream. The place where, like, you know, you can have disaster averted by having, you know, social systems set up that way is part mm-hmm. of the dream. You know, being able to take a $70 high-speed rail ticket from Beijing to Shanghai, leaving the morning of a show and doing a show the night afterwards instead of having to fly you know, that makes the dream easier. So there were, there were a lot of elements in that time that made it easier to be, to take those risks. And now coming back to the States, you know, if I hadn't arrived back with some savings and, you know, the ability to weather a bit of those problems, it would have been very hard to start the tea company. That's for sure. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, Something I want to ask is uh, your standup clips are super Mm -hmm. funny. Um, Obviously to Chinese audiences, but you know, even as like an as an American, you have like yeah. you have you have stand up down. I think. Um, oh well, I, I appreciate <laughs> that. I mean, what is it like for you watching the the Chinese clips as a Chinese American? What's that like? <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Cool. I don't speak Mandarin natively, but I I can get like the cadence of you know what yeah. you're doing. Um, yeah, no, it's really funny. I think um, you play. So I think part of the charm is like, yeah, you're a white dude, obviously that speaks very fluent Chinese. But part mm. of the charm is like you bring it further. Like mm. I think if a Chinese person was saying your jokes too, it would also be very funny. And it's like I can Appreciate feel that. that you've done the research and the work to make your jokes go beyond like, oh, look at me. I'm just like a guy that's yeah. also Chinese, but I'm not Chinese. It, it's definitely it, it it was weirdly enough very discouraging to realize early on as a trying to do Chinese comedy that like, oh, I could literally buy a joke book and then say those words and then it would work i mean but then the question is what am i doing with my life you know like (laughs) the like if anybody could do and it was a real it was a real challenge for me because it took me a while to realize that the in order to be happy doing the intercultural comedy i had to be as close to the writing as possible when i got there i didn't know that like you know i was like hey i like acting it's fun to be on set i might be in movies and then you realize like oh like because it's so easy to get that cheap laugh like no chinese writer is ever going to write a role for a foreigner that's deeper than that so yeah, yeah. if you can get the cheap laugh by doing like some beijing accent hey, well, God, and then they're like ha ha your chinese accent is so good <laughs> if if that's the whole joke then it has to be me that that does the extra work because no one else will ask it of you 
Yeah, um, yeah. And I'm so curious too, like in your process of joke writing, mm -hmm. as like you're writing for your role as a foreigner that speaks fluent Chinese. Yeah. How did you come to understand like what makes Chinese people laugh? <laughs> Well, I mean, a lot of it is just like stage time, like get up in front of people and try to make them laugh. Like at, at some level, it's not more complicated than that. Uh, if you, uh, you know, I think one of the challenges, not just for people doing Chinese comedy, but for any sort of comedy, I know a lot of people that like really enjoy comedy and may even want to do comedy. And then they know I'm a stand up. They're like, oh, I have these jokes that I've been working on. I'm like, oh, have you done them in front of people? Like, no, no, no. I'm just like writing and rewriting them. I'm like, there's at some point, you know, five minutes on stage is going to tell you more than five hours of writing on at home. Um, and I found also that there were certain like there were certain energies maybe that were that like the, like the audience will buy a joke coming from me with one type of energy, but not another. I found that the audience really likes this thing of me like really trying to fit into the culture and failing or succeeding uh you know but like putting in a good effort i found that like the audience really liked that when i came with the whole thing that i had learned after the effort and just kind of like spoke as if that effort were like if, if i if i just talked about society in a way that like showed i had put in the work but i skipped showing the work on stage I just came out and I just started talking about current topics or talking about whatever. I found the audience didn't like it as much. Um, they weren't sure what to do with this guy that had already had these experiences, digested them, and now was talking to them as if they had fully digested something. They needed to go through how I found out about the topic before they'd be comfortable with it. So, Got it. so um, you had to like set up the narrative, like you can't just go. Yeah, like for instance, like, yeah. yeah, like if there was a new app that let's just like say that had come out, you know, or whatever, or like, uh, you know, if there's a new app that came out and everybody's talking about it as a comedian, you just you, you assume that you're going to talk about the stuff everybody's talking about and that the audience will be comfortable with you talking about what everybody's talking about because in society, but they didn't have a concept of like me as a foreigner being just in society. So I would have to say like, Oh, my Chinese friend showed me this app, which was blah, blah, blah. And now everybody's comfortable. They're like, that makes sense how you would know the app if your Chinese friend showed you, but I couldn't just be like, Hey, what do you guys think of this app? Because they'd be like, how do you even know about that? Um, <laughs> yeah. So There's too many questions, too many. Loose yeah, it, and at some yeah. level, like, I mean, I was living in China. At some level, some Chinese person must have showed me the app. It's not like I discovered it literally out of thin air, even if I'm on, you know, my my WeChat moments or whatever. So, like, it's not like it wasn't true that a Chinese friend showed me the app. But I found that if I didn't tell that part of the story, they would be less comfortable. So it's not just Very about nice. what you know. It's about uh, sharing the story in a way that the audience is comfortable with how you learn stuff. Um, and now coming back into the States, I have to do the opposite. Like, I can't just like blast out speaking Chinese. Everybody's too confused about, you know, <laughs> I can't be just like, you know, here's the difference between Lao Banjang and like, you know, and like, you know, Puar, sure. And then people will say like, how do you even know how to say those yeah, words? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have to say like, hey guys, I've spent a long time like in different tea mountains in China and the different mountains have different flavors. Like for instance, you know, you see, so you kind of need to step back that communication and stuff that to you may seem that may seem basic. Now that you've lived it, you kind of need to have the audience relive how you went through those experiences to make them comfortable enough to let their guard down and, and just like enjoy the content. And, sure, you sure. Know, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think there's a difference between the audiences that, you know, you're performed for in China versus the Chinese audiences that you perform for in America? Like, do, do they respond to different jokes? Uh, yeah. Is there like a different sensibility? There's, there's, uh, I, I really like both audiences. They do feel a little bit different. So in, like, for instance, in, in, um, in the States, when I perform for Chinese audiences, you have a bunch of different people. So you have like first generation Chinese immigrants or like new immigrants, like people that just moved to the States a year ago or something like that, uh, and are working in the States or some people who have lived here 10 years and they live in the States. The, that audience is kind of generally well-educated and like a very worldly version of the type of audience I might see in Beijing or Shanghai. Um, uh, th but then you also have like 
Asian Americans who, are, you know, in their comedic taste will be basically the same as an American, a non-Chinese American audience, but in their cultural background will have these weird intersections where sometimes they know exactly what I'm talking about and sometimes they know nothing of what I'm talking about. So like, for instance, if I wanted to do a bit about what it's like on Chinese New Year, where just like you're eating food from like 9 a.m. till midnight, you know, a Chinese American audience might like be totally on board with that. And they might have said like, oh, I've experienced that. Whereas if I talk about how in Beijing, like people will harass you on the street with flyers for gyms, um, like people who Chinese Americans haven't lived through that. So they can understand that as a concept, but it's not like just because they're ethnically Chinese, they're going to get what living in Beijing was yeah. like. And it's it's interesting too, like the Chinese population in America comes from so many different places. Yeah. And there's a lot of varying gaps in knowledge, like culturally, I would say. Yeah. A lot of uh, people like Chinese Americans, they didn't have the chance to go back to China. They've never yeah. been to China. They've never visited their family. Yeah. And then there's yeah. people that go back like every summer or there's people yeah. that go back for, you know, for holidays. Yeah, um, it's 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 a real big mix. And so like for something like tea or comedy like those, I, I think there's a lot of really interesting culture in how people of different uh experiences interact with this because i've gotten some chinese people who are like i love chinese tea i know all the stuff you're talking about you're talking about it at a very basic level but that's what the americans need and then you'll um then you'll find another chinese american who's like oh wow like my grandpa did this tea making and i never asked him about it my dad doesn't do it so like i haven't thought about this in 20 years and so it's really cool to see oh that's what it was like maybe i can get into this and so in a weird way, like obviously the important cultural work was done by their grandparent or their family, but like there was maybe a spark that I delivered that reminded people of that. And then now they're looking up their own cultural history. And I think that's like super cool. Like, um, I, you know, that, that sort of stuff makes me very proud to be like, oh, like uh, it's an un unintended effect of doing English language tea stuff. Um, but like, it feels, it feels like it has a lot of value to those people yeah. that experience it. I, th I think you really deliver that for, um, Chinese Americans. And I'll ask you a question about this later, but, sure. uh, for me, yeah, you, you reinvigorated my interest in like, oh, uh, like Kung Fu Cha and like, do oh, it. like maybe I should actually like do some research about like, sure. um, you know, how to shop for tea and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I have, uh. I guess, how do I phrase this? Actually, I'll, I'll skip over that because I think you kind of answered this question about like the demographic Chinese Americans in your sure, audience. Sure. Um, do, do you have a lot of Chinese Americans in your audience? Like, can you can you kind of like tell like, oh, who is like a, like a mainland Chinese person versus a Taiwanese American versus a Chinese American? Yeah, I think I can. I mean, live, you can tell a lot easier, like, you know, because um it, it, it's not so much that like certain jokes work or don't work, but it's like, I would just choose completely different jokes based off of who I was going for. Mm. Um, my audience is kind of a, in the, in the West, my audience is a weird mix of people because it's a mix of mainland Chinese living in America, um, Chinese Americans or Asian Americans generally that I think are kind of looking for like their taste is a Western taste, but their interest is in learning about Chinese culture um, because if you, if you have a Western taste, even if you went on to like Billy Billy, like Chinese YouTube or whatever, like they're not going to be talking about stuff in the way that makes it approachable for you. There's going to be a lot of assumed knowledge and like assumed taste that, that you, that's hard to pick up on. Like a lot of the, the Chinese tea, uh, creators in China are going to be talking about such narrow topics because like that's cool to them but it's not going to be accessible for say a chinese american yeah comedic comedically same thing like people would be making references that are not as relevant to the to the western raised chinese and then i have another audience of just all the all of the chinese learners around the world so like people who are learning chinese like you know i had a, a very moving moment once where i did a i did a stand-up show uh, for a TV show in China that was like a language competition. So it was people from around the world who studied Mandarin and the finalists get to go to China and film this show. And they're 
um, there, it's like a talent competition. And as like one of the opening of one of the episodes, I went and did five minutes of stand up. Everybody on the show, they were around the thing in a semicircle at booths, like it was like a game show or something. And yeah, I have the country flags over everybody and uh, people from all around the world. And I was doing this, these jokes, and I noticed that the guy from Ghana, for whatever reason, was like super into it. He was like having a great time. And I was like, oh, that's who knows? I, I don't know. Am I big in Ghana? I don't know. And then uh, afterwards, unfortunately, I had to leave very quickly. So I, I left the thing. I, I basically ran to the front door to get a cab to go back to the airport so I didn't miss my flight. And this guy tracked me down and he was like, dude, I got into doing Chinese because I did comedy in Ghana and I saw you were doing comedy in Chinese <laughs> in so cool. China. And he was like, that would be so cool to do Chinese comedy. So he got into learning Chinese and had this whole journey that led him to being in China to shoot the show because he had seen my Chinese comedy videos. And, you know, at the time I had, you know, it was maybe vaguely in the back of my head that like people learning Chinese might be interested, but I definitely wasn't making the videos as like a language teacher. Um, but like you throw these, if you throw that kind of good vibe out into the world, sometimes it comes back in really unexpected sure, yeah. ways. And like it's it's one of those moments sometimes when things are not going well and you're like, oh, the numbers are the numbers are not there or like, you know, what am I doing with my life? You're like you, you actually a lot of the times you don't even recognize the the good that's coming out sure. of it because like, you know, the numbers on the Internet are like just numbers and yeah. but actually behind mm -hmm. all of it, there actually are people that are learning so I, I love that experience that you share um i think you've said this before too that like you really want to be this bridge between mm -hmm. i guess like the american world or the western world and yeah. the chinese world and you had this interview with uh, i think global china connection and yeah. you had this really great quote that i want to kind of dig into mm -hmm. you said um each of us when living in another country is an ambassador for our own countries yeah and i'd love to hear more about like what you mean by this and Maybe like if you could explain how you felt as an ambassador for America uh, sure. while you were an American in Beijing, what did you feel was your responsibility to sure. represent correctly about America? Yeah. Well, that's that's a great question. I mean, the cultural ambassador thing for me, it was very clear at the beginning because going over on Fulbright, this was like a State Department program. So the U.S. State Department and the Chinese Ministry of Education worked together to do Fulbright. Um, or at least they did before President Trump canceled Fulbright, and we're still trying to get Fulbright reinstated. But Fulbright as a system, American academics go to China to do uh, to research China, Chinese academics come to America, vice versa, for 100 something countries around the world, we have this exchange. So going there, you know, because it was a US government program, I felt very clearly like, oh, I'm, I'm a representative in some way of, of America, whether I want to or not. And then when I arrived there, I realized that that was just as true for all those people that were English teachers, for all those people doing educational consulting, um, for my for the other friends of mine, the other people from other countries that were learning, uh, learning crosstalk. I think that it was so valuable that <clears throat> that when I told Chinese people what I was doing, that the U.S. government essentially was paying me to go learn Chinese comedy. Um, they thought that this was really cool because it was like it was giving value to their culture at a very deep level. It's like not just business, not just technology, but like the stuff that regular people do in their lives has value and Americans should learn it. Um, and so it was um, it really made me learn a lot about that that cultural ambassadorship and then seeing how, you know, uh, if you're rude on the if you're rude on the bus, you know, uh, Chinese people just be like, oh, Westerners are rude, um, yeah, yeah. you know, and if you put on a great show, people would be like, oh, Westerners are like, they're really funny. Like, you know, when they can talk, you know, I kind of like what they say. Um, and then I was coming over right at kind of the birth of social media as a real power in the world. And so having a couple viral videos and being able to go on some shows and, and uh, you know, reach the audience made me realize like, you know, we are in an age where regular people taking a funny video about their life or doing a little, you know, silly dance or a comedy routine or making tea. Like this is now the vehicle by which regular people see other people yeah. in another culture. Like we are past the age where the actual ambassador says something and people take that as what Americans mean. 
you know, nowadays it's far more relevant if you have an American video blogger in Beijing, like Chinese people are going to believe that person more than the ambassador for sure. Yeah, so yeah. that kind of means everybody's an ambassador. And so a lot of my work recently, especially the last three years during COVID, where I've kind of been forced onto the internet more than I would normally be, um, has been, okay, so in this world where the, our ambassadors are now digital, how do you be an effective and a responsible cultural ambassador? Mm. Um, because the incentives of the internet don't lead you to be effective and responsible. They lead you to kind of like take quick takes, bash people, flame other people, start arguments, get the comment section going. And, um, you know, it's not actually doing good work, um, but that's kind of more profitable for the social media companies on both sides of the of the world. So yeah. it's um, figuring out a way to do it well, but also make a living and, you know, not like take unnecessary shit from people when they really should be clapped back. Like <laughs> maintaining that balance is um is is a little bit tricky, but that's part yeah. of the fun. Um I like that you mentioned that like all our ambassadors are now digital, right? Yeah. Uh, the most that people that the average person learns about another country is through maybe like someone who uh makes you know like China specific content yeah. or makes you know that cultural specific content. Yeah. Um it's like the uh, the the way I've been saying it. I, I do talks at colleges sometimes, and uh, the way I've been talking about this is saying like, well, most Americans will never go to China, and most Chinese will never come to America. So for most people, the way we interact online is the entirety of the interaction, and mm -hmm. so like this sometimes gets lost by people that do cultural exchange professionally because all, everybody they know has a degree in international relations. Everybody they know has traveled abroad. Everybody they know you know, you might be in interracial relationships and it's just a normal thing. But for a lot of people in, in America and a lot of people in China, they don't know anyone in an interracial relationship. They don't know anyone who travels back and forth. Like, you know, um, it's a it's a real privilege to be in that that class. And I think it's easy to forget that, like, like, I really believe that America and China doing business together and uh, has built both countries up into a better place. But like when you're the the guy in a town where, you know, jobs have gone overseas, you don't see where that benefit is in your life. And like the people who are benefiting from it are not necessarily speaking to you. Yeah. And and like, you know, so it's a um, it's that that type of communication and bringing it down to the people to people level, I think is like going to be super important for maintaining um, you know, goodwill and peace across the relationship. And it's, sure. it's under, it's underappreciated. Yeah. Um, I think I want to maybe like move towards, you know, this, I, these ideas of cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. And first sure. I want to say, of course, like I've done my research on you. I mm -hmm. really respect the work and dedication that you put into learning Chinese. Thank you. Um, you Be actually sure. try to understand Chinese people and culture and, I think there's a respect for the culture that I honest, honestly, I really do not see in a lot of Western content creators when they're making mm. content about China. Mm. I think anytime someone from one culture and, you know, for our purposes, usually white, they attempt to involve themselves in the activities or cultural practices of another culture. Mm -hmm. It might raise eyebrows, right? Especially in yeah. a current political moment um, that really heavily scrutinizes these cultural yeah. faux pas. Um, I want to ask, like, when you started getting involved in Xiangsheng and stand up comedy, did mm -hmm. you ever experience any hesitation about cultural appropriation? Like that you felt that, like there's a boundary you're overstepping? That's a great question. I mean, I was so everything that I've done in China ultimately comes down to the fact that my my Xiangsheng master, Ding Guangquan, took me on as a student and taught me. So this was a man who has studied Chinese comedy for 50 years. He's a disciple of Hobaolin, who is probably the greatest Chinese comedian of all time. And he had spent the last 30 years of his life basically as the only master teacher to take foreign disciples. Um, so uh, he, uh, he had Chinese disciples also. He didn't just teach foreigners, but he was the only one to be able to do it. And so I really got to see a literal master class for seven years of how to, how to study a... Uh, how to study and improve in, uh, in a, a cultural art form, a, a folk art, essentially, East Asian folk art, and how to do it in a way that was that was legit. Um, 
And one of the things that I saw that Master Ding was, he was very, very open. He'll teach anybody who wants to come, but there was a couple things that he would not abide. Um, one of them was like, you had to memorize your lines. So if you're going to come and try to learn comedy and you won't even memorize your script, you know, like, what are you doing here? So there's a base amount of effort that needs to be done. And it needs to be done before you show up and speak with the experts. You don't even deserve to be in the room with the expert if you haven't put in a little bit of homework. Um, he did not require that you learn them well. He required that you try it. Um, because a lot of times people want to come into the classroom and they didn't even put a little bit of effort in. So you need to earn your way into even to get into the classroom. One of the other things I saw that made him very angry was when his foreign disciples were treated like, oh, the, well, the whole point is that they're just like, they're white people or black people or whatever that are doing Xiang Sheng and that's the bit. And he's like, no, that's not the bit. They're doing it well. It has to be done well or else what are we doing here? So the, um, it, it, you know, he would get very angry and he would, he would not take us onto TV shows where he felt the director was not having us do real comedy. Mm -hmm. If the director was having us on because they wanted to have a bunch of international people like speak in Chinese, we didn't go on those shows uh, because he was like, there's no point in denying that you are a foreigner doing this comedy, but you have to actually want to do it well and try to do it well. And then if you're trying to do it well and you fail, sometimes you don't hit, you know, that's being a comedian. You're not going to, you know, sometimes you bomb, but mm -hmm. you're not going to bomb because you're like, oh, well, you know, they're just going to be happy with me putting in a half-assed effort. Um, and it was tricky because from a media perspective, they would have been happy with a half-assed effort, you know, so he had to assert that. And then and I, I imagine the average like yeah. Chinese audience member would just be like extremely amused that there's even like a guy that's not Chinese doing. Yeah. Down, right. But then and then this is also the other thing I keep saying is like he was very good at trying to get the best out of people, but also recognizing that, like, you know, the point of a lot of cultural exchange. And I feel like this is a uh, this is a point where. Uh, you know, I, I don't I don't know if I differ from normal people's take on it or not, but the whole point of the cultural exchange is to do the effort. It almost to some degree doesn't matter how well I do at the show um, or how well I make the tea from a cultural exchange perspective. If I'm putting a real effort into it, if I'm really trying, um, people are super generous in that sense. So like as a as an artwork. I want to do well because if I'm going to make good art, I have to really put work into it. But as a cultural ambassador, that's actually not necessary. And sometimes that that's like, you know, one thing that I think people get wrong with this cultural appropriation or appreciation sort of thing. You don't like no one is born into the world being good at anything like being good at the thing is not what earns you the right to speak. In that video that I did about cultural appropriation yesterday, I was, or I don't know when this is going to air, but I made a video. This guy says, oh, Caucasian guy I shouldn't talk about Asian culture. And I said, no, I feel like I can. But the reason I can is because I went myself to the tea mountain. I learned from people who were willing to teach me and I spend my time making videos. None of that implies I'm good at what I do. But the reason that I'm able to speak is because I put in the effort. And so my learning may be incomplete, but I've done some learning, you know? Yeah, so it sounds like it's like the the effort you've put in, I think, shows, you know, a level of appreciation that's not the typical, like, superficial um, yeah. appreciation that kind of makes people accuse others of cultural Yeah, appreciation. so that's the thing is, like, and, and the... And the purpose of the exchange if it's done well good cultural exchange is done for its own sake like you know you don't go to your friend's house and like learn how to make dumplings so you'll be the best dumpling person in the world you go there because it's like this is a fun thing to do i'm going to have fun with this person and learn while trying to make these dumplings and it doesn't matter how well the dumplings come out if you're doing it well if you go to learn dumplings to like you know, take meticulous notes and take that record and then start an e-commerce company making dumplings like, you know, well, you're kind of going there to extract the knowledge as opposed to going in with an open minded learning and realizing that, you know, maybe yeah. people would like better frozen dumplings. So the, the, the genuine why, cultural exchange that's happening. Yeah, the why you of the, the why yeah. of it, if the why is to uh, like, we'll say like goal oriented that can that can be unhealthy as well so you know luckily 
I think the 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 learning and the experiencing is the fun part. Like you know, yeah. like that that should be the fun part. There's no reason to cut that out. You know. Yeah, and I love it um, that you bring up this idea of um, like extraction and mm -hmm. uh, like these genuine cultural exchanges. Yeah, I ask about this for you know a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. Honestly, one of the things that um, I'm thinking about is this strain of like polyglot videos on YouTube with like mm. sensationalist headlines, like, you know, white guy orders in fluent Chinese and absolutely yeah, shocks yeah. waiters. Yeah. Like, I won't lie that it, as a Chinese American, that gives me the ick, right? Yeah. They're manipulating the situation in such a way that, you know, they can just switch to Chinese randomly and, you know, get a rise out of them. Yeah. Um, there's kind of, there's kind of like a, uh, there's kind of like a mixed feeling I have towards a lot of like language for language's sake. I feel like, language ultimately is a tool to help people talk to other people um you know it's sort of in the same way like if you met a if you met an academic that like was really into reading chinese poetry and new chinese poetry very very well but like refused to speak chinese in a social setting because they were like intimidated or or worried that feels weird it's like like have you really embraced the 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 culture if you're not willing to at least look a little bit silly trying to speak yeah um, and i feel like these interests like let's say like in the chinese poetry or speaking the chinese language you know without yeah. genuine mm. engagement with chinese culture or like trying to give back in some way um chinese culture ends up kind of being like a prop for your ego or for your business or uh, yeah it's very exploitative, it, in my opinion. And, and this is something I'd be interested in, in hearing your thought about, especially as an Asian American. I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of times where in the process of trying to westernize or localize the the traditional culture, which I'm not inherently against. I think that if traditional culture is going to survive, it has to be modernized, even if it's within China. You know, I can't keep doing 100 year old comedy bits and then like refuse to acknowledge that the last hundred years happened and I should be incorporating that into my comedy, you know, <clears throat> if, um, uh, but sometimes it comes across in a way that feels uh, extractive. Like, you know, for instance, I saw a, I saw a e-commerce company that was selling Chinese medicinal um, gummies um, and it had like Chinese medicinal flavors in essentially a candy which is totally fine if it's a candy, but they were also trying to say that it had like Chinese medicinal value. And I'm like, well, for Chinese medicine, how much you take, how it was created, how it was prepared, like all that stuff matters to the people who prescribe something like this doesn't have any particular Chinese medicinal importance just because you used an herb mm -hmm. to flavor it. Just like say it's a flavored candy, Asian flavored candy, which is fine. So like, but like if a Chinese and a lot of these things are um, are made usually by Chinese Americans um, and then that uh, that attempt sometimes comes off to me like, oh, well, it no one's going to be able to no one's going to be able to ask the Chinese American person where it was legit and where it wasn't because they'll feel too intimidated to ask that question. Um, so, like, do you feel like sometimes those localizations are done poorly or do you feel like generally it's like, you know, it's so hard to do that even a, a, a poorly done one is going to be better than nothing. Like, how do you feel about that? That's an excellent question. Um, I often see these attempts at localization uh, for whatever product, you know, uh, as an attempt to kind of reintegrate oneself with their, ethnic heritage right mm. um you know sometimes it's done very well uh, something yeah. i'm thinking about actually is you know you know maku you know what maku, maku is? what is it um so it's like a you know makuli in korean culture it's like the rice wine oh okay uh, yeah yeah they, there's like an americanized version with like you know mango passion fruit flavors and you know what yeah, it's yeah. really really good like yeah, oh nice. they've successfully integrated themselves and like uh you know touch the base with their with their home culture Mm -hmm. uh, I often take it in good faith, even if it's kind of inaccurate in the way that you're talking about, because yeah. I think I totally understand like the impulse to want to come back to that place, especially living in America where your culture gets extracted for social yeah. value and nothing comes back to, you know, your yeah. group. So, yeah, that makes sense. And I think the, uh, it's almost, you know, I, I think it's and it's all it's like any other thing, like I suppose, like the it's hard to be able to tell the motive, like 
the motive being kind of this self-discovery journey makes a lot more sense to me um, than the motive being like, you know, it's, it's sort of like, okay, well, other people are extracting my culture. So why don't I extract my culture? You know, but, but you're right in that it's always kind of a, a weird spectrum of all these elements are there, you know, and even, even with, um, you know, with the question, like occasionally with the tea, you know, I run a tea company now. Um, sometimes people ask me, they're like, oh, well, shouldn't Asian people be making this money? And I'm like, that's where I bought the tea from. Asian people are making this money. <laughs> like, um, you know, I, I, like I'm on TikTok. TikTok is an Asian company. Like, you know, the I, I buy cardboard boxes in Asia. Like, you know, it like everything is going on in Asia. Um, and there are a lot of Asian people making the money. But then but but at the end of the day, I'm also profiting from making the making the tea well. And it's a little bit tricky to tell who's profiting from where. I mean, my own take on it is that what I'm profiting from is being a bridge to help tea, uh, tea vendors in China who don't want to be making English social media videos to be able to share their teas with people, um, which they're very glad to be able to do. I, I also think I make money from essentially taking on the risk of the fact that like there is no real market in America for raw Puar tea. Um, yeah. And so if they want to sell it in America, like they'd rather take cash now and then have somebody else deal with the problem that there is no market for this and try to sell it. And mm -hmm. so like that's also part of where the profit comes in. But um, uh, but like in the end of the day, these are like very specific things. And like very you have true. to kind of almost be in the tea industry to know where I'm profiting and where I'm not profiting. Um, uh, and, and so I think. Yeah, personally, I suspect like a lot of the backlash, you know, I've, I've seen like, mm -hmm. I think three videos at this point where you address mm -hmm. these like, kind of like yeah. call outs for being a white dude that that yeah. makes tea or sells tea. Yeah, I guess like as an Asian American, I maybe understand uh, maybe like the defensiveness at which people yeah. might come at you because yeah. you know, it's different for Asians in Asia because, you know, realistically, yeah. like they're not going to be harmed by, you know, you, you know, trying to... Uh, involve yourself in their culture because they are the yeah. dominant group in that country. Exactly. But yeah, there, there's like Asian a... Americans here, they feel very like, very protective, right? Like, yeah. for example, like in those videos that I'm talking about, you know, a white guy shocks a Chinese waiter mm -hmm. with fluent Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, I feel very protective of older Chinese people who mm -hmm. try to make a life in America, but don't fully understand the complex racial sure. dynamics in the US, right? Yeah. So it's well, they, have to, of like they have to kind of go through. It's funny on, on that topic. I have a so I host a uh, radio show for the local Chinese radio station here in Mandarin, and I have a call in show. And a lot of the people are listening to Chinese radio on Tuesday at 3 p.m. or whatever. They're older, retired Chinese people that, you know, don't speak English well enough that they're they're listening to English radio. They want to hear a Mandarin radio. And so we had a call in show and like it's it's surprising that like you can live your your like you know 30 years in California but not know many Americans to talk about current topics like you know i had a we had a call in show where people are asking like what's going on in israel and gaza like i was the first jewish person that anybody could talk to in chinese fluently mm -hmm. about what was going on there and i was like oh this is this is complicated and heavy and difficult to explain but like you know those people can be taken advantage of very easily because they have such like uh they they I think like white Americans don't recognize how difficult it can be as that first generation immigrant to get into society. You need to, it really helps to be like fully Western educated and work at Western companies and like, but a lot of immigrants don't do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that sort of recognition is, uh, is, as you said, it's important and people need to be um, I, I get that sense of protectiveness because the, the they are very vulnerable in the American system and Americans may not even realize how vulnerable they are, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I think that the um, there is also a value in connectiveness of like, um, especially across generations where like when you can show whatever Chinese auntie is, is kind of like your auntie, um, you know, you can be like, oh yeah, like, you know, like, why would I be afraid of them? Why would I be afraid of Chinese people? Like Chinese people is also this nice auntie who's helping this guy, you know, do dumplings or whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, I think it's like many things on the internet being, as I said, re effective and responsible. Responsible in part means that the people who are in your videos know that they're in them and they're comfortable and that, 
you get some sort of permission <laughs> to be able to to do stuff. Um, but it's like, you know, but you don't want to go around making people sign contracts also because like that's an unreasonable standard for this age where everybody's a everybody's an ambassador. If we require the 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 good hearted people to be getting everybody's signature to post a video, the bad hearted people will just run over everyone very because true. they won't be they won't be doing that. Um, so and it's like, you know, I, I guess like on the topic of that, um, well, ob obviously, like I know that you do a lot of research and you uh mm -hmm. you do really deep dives into things that i think show this respect for chinese culture but i think mm -hmm. to the less discerning eye people are just gonna be like like rage and be like oh white guy making chinese tea yeah. or like i, yeah, I, will, yeah, I will say though that like it, it it's th there's a reason why these comments and videos go viral and it's because like everybody hating on each other is literally the gas that runs a social yes. media engine so like <laughs> I think that people, I, I, I may be unfortunate that I have to deal so much with social media in my day-to-day -day life because once you get into it, you realize like it's not particularly complicated. Like the algorithms are built to maximize profit for the companies. People have this vague idea that the best stuff gets to the top. The best stuff doesn't get to the top. The most profitable stuff for that platform gets to the top. Sure. And if they have, if they have figured out that keeping people on the site makes the money then making people very happy or very angry is the best way to keep them on the site. Because if like, if somebody posts a video and they're like, you know, this sandwich is okay. Like that video is not going to go viral. Like it has to be like this sandwich is like, you know, bathed in the blood of immigrants or this sandwich is like the best thing ever. Like either of those is more likely to get people angry. Sure, so sure. it's, it's I, almost I guess I, a reason. Yeah. No. I wanted to ask, like, what's your, when you, when you get these accusations of cultural yeah. appropriation, like yeah. what is your first reaction before you respond to it? And yeah. how do you eventually go about forming a response to these accusations? Um, um, it's, it's yeah. an interesting, it's, so I am, I don't know, fortunate or unfortunate to have basically grown up as a performer in China. So this was a place where one Chinese person reporting me to the platform could get my entire account shut down forever and potentially get me blacklisted and deported. Um, I have like absolutely no fear of these people in America that don't <laughs> whine on the internet. There is no negative consequence that will come of me, come of it because of people whining about this. And, and I also feel like, you know, it, it's like, I feel like, I think that those comments, every time I get them, I will take a look and say like, is this legit? And usually because I've spent 12 years being a professional cultural ambassador, usually what they're saying is not legit. Sometimes there's a more legit angle to it. And so that is something you can like learn from. Like, for instance, like, okay, if somebody's like, this guy's stealing my culture as a Chinese American, I might say, I don't think that's accurate. But what I do take out of that is that this is a sensitive thing for Chinese Americans. And I and I should be respectful of the fact that at least that it's sensitive, even if I believe I'm doing something that's okay. Um, and so for so I'll try to take out if there is any educational knowledge should be taken out of it. I'll try to take out and address that part because usually that's the most interesting part of the thing is like, okay, you yelled at me, which I think you're wrong, but why did you yell at me? That's kind of a more interesting question. Right. I'll kind of look at it that way. And I've seen you uh, respond to people's uh, paragraphs in your comments too. And I'm like, yeah. I was actually like really impressed. I, was, I don't think I know any content creator that mm. genuinely attempts to, you know, address these things and like be such a... Uh, uh that tries to explain you know what they're doing and you know create a dialogue right yeah um, i think the dialogue is really important because it's like i think people incorrectly believe a lot of times that if they if they know the answer to something then they just have to put it out there and then if the other if everybody else in the world doesn't get it the, then they're stupid or it's their fault and it's like no you need to start from where people are so it's like just like when I go on stage in, in America and I want to talk about the Red Sox, I can't assume that people in China are going to know what baseball is even. So like, and it's not like the audience being dumb or bad or like they're like, they're like ignorant people if they don't know. It's just an unreasonable thing for me to expect other people to know. Similarly, if you live in a place with no Chinese people and no Chinese culture, maybe very few immigrants, period, you're probably not going to have a, a very sophisticated take on whether what I'm doing is, you know, cultural appropriation or whatever, you're probably going to be working off of emotions that are not based in that much experience. And so 
just like I wouldn't expect a Chinese person to know what baseball is, I shouldn't expect like randos on the internet to be experts in, in analyzing whether my joke about Chinese comedy is hack or not, you know, mm -hmm. um, or whether my T video is, you know, proper or not. And, and it's so funny that I you think, mentioned that, uh, yeah. you're just like being a Chinese American that grew up in like the San Gabriel Valley and I'm literally yeah. surrounded by Chinese culture 24 seven Yeah, and then going to college or going to the workplace and realizing, huh, this is not, they don't know. um, yeah, they just don't know. They don't know. Yeah. And yeah, forget college in the workplace. Like I've met people in the entertainment business in LA who I think truly want to in like increase diversity in media and have never made the 40 minute drive to the San Gabriel Valley. Like yeah. they just like, it's all right there. If you actually want to meet the Chinese people, they're all right there. You just have to go. Like you can't wait for them to come to the comedy club in West Hollywood because the type of people that do that are already playing to your taste. They're yeah. not yeah. making what they would be making generally. So there's a lot of like, um, you know, this is one of the biggest shames about the internet's being cut apart between the US and Chinese internet. There's a lot of really great Chinese artists but they have to make a choice. They're like, am I going to do what I'm going to do in a way that I will not be harassed or, or blocked in the mainland, which is going to mean Westerners are going to potentially think my work is hack or not, you know, not pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. Or am I going to play into the fact that Westerners see a Chinese artist as I must be upset about the censorship. I must be oppressed. I must be whatever. Yeah. You're kind of like forced to make a choice, which is really... Um, it's a choice based off of the ignorance of the Western audience and the restrictions that have been put upon creators within their sure. own media system. So I, I love that I, you. I, I've got like two minutes. I have like sure, literally two sure. minutes because I can't be late for this other call. But um, anything uh, you want to finish up with? I guess like the man. There's so many questions that I, I love. I love this conversation right now. But mm. let's just we can finish it up. Um, I guess with Chinese stand up, your tea shop and your podcast, uh, ultimately, what would you like to see happen as a result of your endeavors? And has this goal changed or shifted in the past couple of years? Yeah, I mean, my my original goal out of college was if I could find a way to not have a job job and be my own boss and perform, <laughs> I'm already happy. And I got there. And then for years, moving back to America, my greatest fear would that I wouldn't be able to do it in this country because you have to pay for your own health care and car insurance and all that sort of stuff. It's more expensive. Um, so I'm really almost kind of still shell shocked from the fact that I've pulled it off here. I don't think I really have accepted the fact that I've, I've done well enough that I can pursue those other things now, those creative or artistic things. And so my hope is that I'm able to combine all these things together. I would love to have like a late night show type thing where I'm doing some stand up. Then I have people over the tea table and drink and have a discussion I mean, I'd love to do it bilingually. I can host in English or Chinese or anywhere in the middle. And I think that one of the cool things about the internet now is if you subtitle stuff, you know, the you may have a hard time selling live tickets to a bilingual show, but like people will dig the content no matter what language it's in if you do a good job with sure, it. Sure. That's uh, great. I got to log great. off immediately Thanks. because I have sure. an important meeting. But um, um, thank you again so much for the invite. And um, uh, let me know if you have any, yeah, uh, yeah. if you have any other questions, I can maybe send you a voice memo or got something it, like got that. Got it. Got so. it. Sure. Awesome. All right. Great. Thanks, Jesse. Thank really you so appreciate much. your time. Have a good yeah, one. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.